Hello and welcome to lecture two of the preliminaries unit in Phys 1104. And in this unit we're going to look at units and measurements. You've probably met the Système International, SI, set of units, which is internationally agreed upon. And one reason to realize that there's international consensus on these units is that it's important for industry as well as science. Just imagine trying to get something like GPS satellites working if we didn't have an internationally agreed upon set of units. In this course, almost everything we do will be working in terms of just three of the base SI units, the meter, the second, and the kilogram. In Phys 1204, you'll meet the ampere, which is the standard unit of electrical current. And I'm sure in other courses, you've already met the mole and the kelvin. The candela, you might never encounter unless you do very specific work on measurement of light. Every measurement we do involves some sort of a comparison. So, for example, in the everyday example of just measuring something like this pen and measuring its length, you're comparing the length of the pen with lengths marked off on a ruler. You could, of course, compare it instead with, say, finger widths. You could count your own finger widths along the pen, and that's also a measurement. The difference between that and doing it with a ruler is that when you're doing it with the ruler, you're working with an agreed-upon standard so that your measurement is meaningful to other people. And that standard, which was used to mark off your ruler so that you mark your ruler is the same as anyone else's, involved a calibration, which is a sort of an experiment. What do I mean it's an experiment? Well, here's an example of an old way that a unit of length, in this case a foot, was determined. Pause the video and read the description. In 16th century Germany, that's how they determined the length of the foot. I don't know how often they ran this experiment, whether it was yearly or whatever, but this meant that their definition of the foot changed from time to time. But this is an experiment that was used to calibrate the length of the foot. Well, today we don't do that. We use reasonably unchanging measurement calibrations. The SI has to establish these experiments, which you can do anywhere in the world to come up with a calibrated measurement instrument. So for example, our current definition of the second is that you take cesium-133 and you make it emit a particular type of light that it emits, and you count the periods in the oscillations of the, of the light. And that's your definition of the second. And so this means that in a factory, if they're trying to make high precision timekeepers or something else, they're carrying out something like this definition. And just a warning, SI is periodically updated because we're doing experiments. As technology advances, we have better ways to do these calibration experiments. And so in particular, there's a big revision to SI coming up probably in about 2018, when all these definitions are going to change. Perhaps you don't feel that scientific notation is easier, but in fact we use scientific notation because it does make things easier. So just for example, on the previous page I wrote this number. Compare that with if I had written this. That may look more comfortable to you, but realize that when you start reading it and you read that 9, you don't know what that 9 means until you count digits and you see that there are 9 digits following it, and so it's in the billions place. Whereas when we write it in scientific notation, the order of magnitude is right there, easy to see, you don't have to go counting digits. And so we know that that 9 is 9 billion, although a scientist would prefer just to say 9 times 10 to the 9, because what we call a billion in North America, for example, isn't what they call a billion in Britain. So we all agree what 10 to the 9 means, but we don't all agree what billion means. Orders of magnitude themselves are important to be able to picture and to have an idea of. I really recommend that you watch these videos. Um, the top one here is a quite old video, kind of dated now, but in some ways I think it's still better than the newer one. They're both worth a look, and I'll put these links below the video. You should have met the SI prefixes in previous courses, and so at least for the more common ones, which I've listed here, you should know these already. And that's all I have to say about that. If you don't know them, learn them.
There are only seven basic SI units, but there are way more than seven types of quantities that we can measure. So what do we do for all the rest? Well, we have to build the units for them out of our basic units. And we call these then the derived units. The way you do that is you just look at any equation which defines the quantity that you're interested in or which contains the quantity. So here are some defining equations for some quantities, and let's look at how we use the equations to build the units for them. This process of using equations to find the units of a quantity you're interested in is called unit analysis, or it's one use of unit analysis. So let's try it out. Here's an average velocity. Don't worry if you don't know these equations. We'll deal with them later. Right now you just need to know what types of quantities each thing is. So this is a velocity. We want to know its units. And we see in the equation it is a change in position divided by a change in time. And so we can just say then that any velocity, because it doesn't matter whether it's an average velocity or any other sort of velocity, they'll all have the same units. So a velocity has the units of a delta x, a position, let's say meters, we could use kilometers or miles if you insist, whatever, divided by a time, well, time might as well be in seconds, and so there we go, a velocity is in meters per second. Well, let's proceed. An acceleration well, it's a delta v. We already know what a delta v is because that's a velocity. And so that's meters per second. That's then divided by a time again. And a time again will be in seconds. So meters per second divided by seconds. So that gives us meters per second squared. And those are the units of an acceleration. Okay, now we can use this one to find the units of a force. So a, f a, sum, oops, a sum of forces is a force, and so we can say a force has the units of, and we have, again, an acceleration here, and we also have a mass. Well, so the mass will be in, say, kilograms. That blue doesn't show up very well, does it? Let's try, well, we'll just use yellow. And the acceleration is, again, in meters per second squared. And so there are our units for a force, a kilogram meter per second squared, which you may or may not already know is a newton. What is three miles plus four hours? Is it seven something or others? Is it true that five kilometers equals five kilograms? Well, I hope you agree with me that both of these are totally ridiculous and meaningless questions. You simply can't do this. On the other hand, you can do three miles plus four kilometers. Now, you'd better be careful. It's not going to be seven of anything, because you're going to have to either convert the miles to kilometers or the kilometers to miles before you carry out the addition. But you can do it because you can do those conversions, because miles and kilometers are both units speaking about length. And so we say these quantities have the same dimensions, even though they have different units. And so we can add them, whereas miles and hours can't be added because they have different dimensions. You can't convert miles to hours. There's no way you can do that. So a, a dimension is just a quantity that can be measured in a particular way. So to clarify, to clarify that, for example, time you can define as a thing you measure with a clock. Now you could express it with seconds or hours or fortnights or whatever you want, but what it comes down to is that no matter which units you use to express it, you will have measured it with a clock, and that's how you know that it's a time. Another very good use of unit analysis is that we can use it when we're not sure about an equation that we've written down to check whether maybe we've made a mistake. So there are some rules that are handy. You can't add apples and oranges, and similarly you can't add times and lengths or temperatures and electric field strengths. Only quantities with the same dimension can be added. 
Also, both sides of an equation have to always have the same dimension. But notice that there's no problem with multiplying or dividing things with different dimensions. That's what we did a few minutes ago to get derived units. All that happens is that when you take quantities of different dimensions and multiply or divide them, you get a new quantity with different dimensions, which means it must have some different physical meaning from what you started with. The other thing is that constant numbers in most equations, like the 2s and pi's and things like that that tend to be lying around in a lot of equations, are usually dimensionless. So these are all the rules we need, and let's see an example of checking an equation to see if we've made a mistake with it. Here is an equation, and I'll warn you right up front, I've made a mistake writing this equation. And it doesn't matter whether you know this equation or not, or the equation this is supposed to be, but this is one you'll meet in the one-dimensional motion unit of the course, or rather, it's a wrong version of it. And let's see that it's wrong by checking its units. So, first of all, I'll start with this side. So there's a velocity and I've got it squared. So I know over here I've got a velocity which is in meters per second, and that is all squared. And that equals, and again, I've got a velocity here, and so that's in meters per second, and that's all squared. Oops. Okay, so far so good. Meters per second all squared equals meters per second all squared. Things are looking fine at the moment. Now the rest. Okay, this 2, this 2 is dimensionless. We don't care. It has no units. It doesn't factor into our unit analysis. Now we have an acceleration. We know what an acceleration is. It's in meters per second squared. And that is all times a time in seconds. So look what we've got. We've got meters squared per second squared equals meters squared per second squared, so far so good, plus, and now the seconds takes out that seconds, and we've got meters per second. Oops! Meters per second aren't the same as meters squared per second squared. And so this equation has to be wrong. It's absolute nonsense. It's like me saying I was 33 years old when I arrived in Cape Breton, and the time I've been here is equal to 10 degrees Celsius, and so that means my current age must be 43 moles, right? Nonsense, absolute total nonsense, and so is this. One more thing we have to look at with unit analysis is how it plays out in transcendental functions. Now, you may have no idea what I mean by a transcendental function, but in fact you've met plenty before, because the trigonometric functions and exponential and log functions are all examples of transcendental functions. And for now that's all you need to know. If you're in this course you're also taking calculus, and you'll learn all about what a transcendental function is in your calculus course. But here are the rules that have to, have to be obeyed by equations containing transcendental functions. The output of the transcendental function has to be dimensionless. Now, remember what I mean by that. A function is a thing where you put one number in, and it spits out a different number. So what I'm saying is that the numbers spit out by the transcendental function must be dimensionless. Also, the argument, or in other words, the input of the transcendental function, also has to be dimensionless. So now we can use that to analyze an equation like this. Now this is an equation you'll meet in Phys 1204, and it contains quantities that might not mean much to you at the moment, but it doesn't really matter. We can still do a unit analysis. This i, I'm going to tell you, is a current, and so it's measured in amperes. Now we can use our rules. This exponential over here has to be dimensionless, and so that means that this i0 also has to be a current for the two sides of the equation to have the same units. Now let's look at the input to the exponential, this thing up here. Well, that has to be dimensionless. The little t is a time, and so that tells you, to make that all dimensionless, that this rc, whatever that is, also has to be a time. And so now you could, if you knew what the dimensions of r and c were, go and verify that they are in fact a time when you multiply them together.